There is no part of the world of coasts, continents, oceans, seas, straits, capes, and islands which is not under the sway of a reigning wind, the sovereign of its typical weather. The wind rules the aspects of the sky. and the action of the sea. But no wind rules unchallenged his realm of land and water, as with the kingdoms of the earth there are regions more turbulent than others. In the middle belt of the earth the trade winds reign supreme, undisputed like monarchs of long-settled kingdoms, whose traditional power, checking all undue ambitions, is not so much an exercise of personal might as the working of long-established institutions. The intertropical kingdoms of the trade winds are favorable to the ordinary life of a merchant man. The trumpet call of strife is seldom borne on their wings to the watchful ears of men on the decks of ships. The regions ruled by the northeast and southeast trade winds are serene in a southern-going ship bound out for a long voyage. The passage through their dominions is characterized by a relaxation of strain and vigilance on the part of the seamen. Those citizens of the ocean feel sheltered under the aegis of an uncontested law of an undisputed dynasty. There, indeed, if anywhere on earth, the weather may be trusted, yet not too implicitly. Even in the constitutional realm of trade winds, north and south of the equator, ships are overtaken by strange disturbances. Still, the easterly winds, and generally speaking, the easterly weather, all over the world is characterized by regularity and persistence. As a ruler, the east wind has a remarkable stability. As an invader of the high latitudes lying under the tumultuous sway of his great brother, the wind of the west he is extremely difficult to dislodge by the reason of his cold craftiness and profound duplicity. The narrow seas around these isles where British admirals keep watch and ward upon the marches of the Atlantic Ocean are subject to the turbulent sway of the west wind. Call it northwest or southwest, it is all one a different fret. <clears throat> different phase of the same character, a changed expression on the same face. The orientation of the winds that rule the seas, the north and south directions are of no importance. There are no north and south winds of any account upon this earth. The north and south winds are but small princes in the dynasties that make peace and war upon the sea. They never assert themselves upon a vast stage. They depend upon local causes, the configuration of coasts, the shapes of straits, the accents of bold promontories round which they play their little part. In the polity, polity of winds, the, as amongst the tribes of earth, the real struggle lies between east and west. The west wind reigns over the seas surrounding the coast of these kingdoms, and from the gateways of the channels, from promontories as if from watchtowers, from estuary <coughs> estuaries of rivers as if from postern gates, from passageways, endless straits, first the garrison of the isle and the crews of the ships going and returning, look to the westward to judge by the varied splendors of his sunset mantle the mood of that arbitrary ruler. The end of the day is the time to gaze at the kingly face of the westerly weather, who is the arbiter of ship's destinies, benignant and splendid, or splendid and sinister. The western sky reflects the hidden pur purposes of the royal mind, clothed in a mantle of dazzling gold or draped in rags of black clouds like a beggar. The mighty of the westerly winds sits enthroned upon the western horizon with the whole North Atlantic 
as a footstool for his feet and the first twinkling stars making a distem for his brow. Then the seamen, attentive quarters of the weather, think of regulating the conduct of their ship by the mood of the master. The west wind is too great a king to be a dissembler. He is no calculator plotting deep schemes in a somber heart. He is too strong for small artifices. There is passion in all his moods, even in the soft mood of his serene days, in the grace of his blue sky, whose immense and unfathomable tenderness, reflected in the mirror of the sea, embraces, possesses, lulls to sleep the ships with white sails. He is all things to all oceans. He is like a poet seated upon a throne, magnificent, simple, barbarous, pensive, generous, impulsive, changeable, unfathomable. But when you understand him, always the same. Some of his sunsets are like pageants devised for the delight of the multitude when all the gems of the royal treasure house are displayed above the sea. Others are like the opening of his royal confidence, tinged with thoughts of sadness and compassion and a melancholy splendor meditating upon the short-lived peace of the waters. And I have seen him put the pent-up anger of his heart into the aspect of the inaccessible sun and cause it to, gr to glare fiercely like the eye of an implacable autocrat out of a pale and frightened sky. He is the war lord who sends his battalions of Atlantic rollers to the assault of our seaboard. The compelling voice of the west wind musters up to his service all the might of the ocean. At the bidding of the west wind there arises a great commotion in the sky above the islands and a great rush of waters falls upon our shores. The sky of the westerly weather is full of flying clouds, of great big white clouds coming thicker and thicker till they seem to stand welded into a solid canopy upon whose gray face the lower rack of the gale, thin black and angry looking, flies past with vertiginous speed. Denser and denser grows this dome of vapors descending lower and lower upon the sea, narrowing the horizon around the ship, and the characteristic aspect of westerly weather, the thick, gray, smoky, and sinister tone sets in, circumscribing the view of the men, drenching their bodies, oppressing their souls, taking their breath away with booming gusts, deafening, blinding, driving, rushing them onwards in a swaying ship towards our coasts, lost in mist and rain. The caprice of the winds, like the willfulness of men, is fraught with the disastrous consequences of self-indulgence. Long anger, the sense of his uncontrolled power, spoils the frank and generous nature of the West. Wind. It is as if a heart, his heart, were corrupted by a malevolent and brooding Rancor, rancor, he devastates his own kingdom in the wantonness of his force. Southwest is the quarter of the heavens where he presents his darkened brow. He breathes his rage in terrific squalls and overwhelms his realm with an inexhaustible welter of clouds. He strews the seeds of anxiety upon the decks of scudding ships makes the foam-stripped ocean look old, and sprinkles with gray hairs the heads of shipmasters and the homeward-bound ships running for the channel. The westerly wind asserting his sway from the southwest quarter is often like a monarch gone mad, driving forth with wild imprecations the most faithful of his courtiers to shipwreck disaster and death. The southwesterly weather is the thick weather par excellence. It is not 
the thickness of the fog. It is rather a contraction of the horizon, a mysterious veiling of the shores with clouds that seem to make a low vaulted dungeon around the running ship. It is not blindness, it is a shortening of the sight. The west wind does not say to the seaman, you shall be blind. It restricts merely the range of his vision and raises the dread of land within his breast. It makes of him a man robbed of half his force, of half his efficiency. Many times in my life, standing in long sea boots and streaming oilskins at the elbow of my commander on the poop of a homeward bound ship, making for the channel and gazing ahead into the gray and tormented waste, I have heard a weary sigh shape itself into a studiously casual comment. Can't see very far in this weather, and have made answer in the same low, perfunctory tone, no sir. It would be merely the instinctive voicing of an ever-present thought associated closely with the consciousness of the land somewhere ahead and of the great speed of the ship. Fair wind, fair wind, who would dare to grumble at a fair wind? It was a favor of the western king who rules masterfully the North Atlantic from the latitude of the Azores to the latitude of Cape Farewell. A famous shove this to end a good passage with, and yet somehow one could not muster upon one's lips the smile of a courtier's gratitude. This favor was dispensed to you from under an overbearing scowl, which is the true expression of the great autocrat. When he has made up his mind to give a battering to some ships and to hunt certain others home in one breath, cruelty and benevolence, equally distracting. No, sir, can't see very far. Thus would the mate's voice repeat the thought of the master, both gazing ahead while under their feet the ship rushes at some twelve knots in direction of the lee shore, and only a couple of miles in front of her, swinging and dripping jib-boom, carried naked with an upward slant like a spear, a gray horizon closes the view. With a multitude of waves surging upwards violently, as if to strike at the stooping clouds, awful and threatening scowls darken the face of the west wind in his clouded southwest mood, and from the king's throne hall in the western board stronger gust reach you, like the fierce shouts of raving fury to which only the gloomy grandeur of the scene imparts a saving dignity. A shower pelts the deck and the sails of the ship as if flung with a scream by an angry hand, and when the night closes in, the night of a southwesterly gale, it seems more hopeless than the shades of Hades. The southwesterly mood of the great west wind is a lightless mood, without sun, moon, or stars, with no gleam of light but the phosphorescent flashes of the great sheets of foam that, boiling up on each side of the ship, fling bluish gleams upon her dark and narrow hull, rolling as she runs, chased by enormous seas, distracted in the tumult. There are some bad nights in the kingdom of the West Wind, for homeward-bound ships making for the channel, and the days of wrath upon them colorless, and vague like the timid turning up of invisible lights upon the scene of a tyrannical and passionate outbreak, awful in the monotony of its method and the increasing strength of its violence. It is the same wind, the same clouds, the same wildly racing seas, the same thick horizon around the ship, only the wind is stronger, the clouds seem denser and more overwhelming, the waves appear to have grown bigger and more threatening during the night. The hours whose minutes are marked by the crash of the breaking seas slip by with the screaming, pelting squalls overtaking the ship as she runs on and on with darkened canvas, with streaming spars and dripping ropes. The downpours thicken, preceding each shower a mysterious
gloom like the passage of a shadow above the firm cement of gray clouds, firmament of gray clouds, filters down upon the ship. Now and then the rain pours upon your head in streams as if from spouts. It seems as if your ship were going to be drowned before she sank, as if all atmosphere had turned to water. Your gasp, you gasp, you splutter, you are blinded and deafened. You are submerged, obliterated, dissolved, annihilated, streaming all over as if your limbs too had turned to water, and every nerve on the alert you watch for the clearing up mood of the western king that shall come with a shift of wind as like as not to whip all the three masts out of your ship in the twinkling of an eye. Heralded by the increasing fierceness of the squalls, sometimes by a faint flash of lightning, like the signal of a lighted torch waved far away behind the clouds, the shift of wind comes at last, the crucial moment of the change from the brooding and veiled violence of the southwest gale to the sparkling, flashing, cutting, clear-eyed anger of the king's northwesterly mood. You behold another phase of his passion, <clears throat> a fury bejeweled with stars, mayhap bearing the crescent of the moon on its brow, shaking the last vestiges of its torn cloud mantle in the inky black squalls with hail and sleet descending like showers of crystals and pearls, bounding off the spars, drumming on the sails, pattering on the oil skin coats, whitening the decks of homeward bound ships, faint ruddy flashes of lightning flicker in the starlight upon her mastheads, a chilly blast hums in the taut rigging, causing the ship to tremble to her very keel and the soaked men on her decks to shiver in their wet clothes to the very marrow of their bones, before one squall has flown over to sink in the eastern board, the edge of another peeps up already over the western horizon, racing up swift, shapeless, like a black bag full of frozen water ready to burst over your devoted head. The temper of the ruler of the ocean has changed, each gust of the clouded mood that seemed warmed by the heat and of a heart flaming with anger has its counterpart in the chilly blasts that seem blown from a breast turned to ice with a sudden revulsion of feeling. Instead of blinding your eyes and crushing your soul with a terrible apparatus of cloud and mists, and seas and rain, the king of the west turns his power to contemptuous pelting of your back with icicles to making your weary eyes water as if in grief and your worn out carcass quake pitifully. But each mood of the great autocrat has its own greatness and each is hard to bear. Only the northwest phase of that mighty display is not demoralizing to the same extent, because between the hail and sleet squalls of a northwesterly gale one can see a long way ahead. To see to see, this is the craving of the sailor, as of the rest of blind humanity. To have his path made clear for him is the aspiration of every human being, and are the clouded and tempestuous existence, I have heard a reserved, silent man, with no nerves to speak of, after three days of hard running in thick southwesterly weather, burst out passionately, <clears throat> I wish to God we could get sight of something. We had just gone down below for a moment to commune in a battened down cabin, with a large white chart lying limp and damp upon a cold and clammy table under the light of a smoky lamp, sprawling over that seaman silent and trusted adviser, with one elbow upon the coast of Africa and the other planted in the neighborhood of Cape Hatteras. It was a general tr 
track chart of the North Atlantic. My skipper lifted his rugged, hairy face and glared at me in a half-exasperated, half-appealing way. We have seen no sun, moon, or stars for something like seven days. By the effect of the west wind's wrath, the celestial bodies had gone into hiding for a week or more, and the last three days had seen the force of a southwest gale rove from fresh through strong to heavy as the entries in my logbook could testify. Then we separated, he to go on deck again in obedience to that mysterious call that seems to sound forever in a shipmaster's ears. I to stagger into my cabin with some vague notion of putting down the words very heavy weather in a log book not quite written up to date, but I gave it up and crawled into my bunk instead, boots and hat on. All standing, it did not matter, everything was soaking wet, a heavy sea having burst the poop skylights the night before to remain in a nightmarish state between waking and sleeping for a couple of hours of so-called rest. <clears throat> the southwesterly mood of the west wind is an enemy of sleep and even of a recumbent position in the responsible officers of a ship. After two hours of futile, light-headed, inconsequent thinking upon all things under heaven in that dark, dank, wet, and devastated cabin, I arose suddenly and staggered up on deck. The autocrat of the North Atlantic was still oppressing his kingdom and its outlying dependencies, even as far as the Bay of Biscay, in the dismal secrecy of thick, very thick weather. The force of the wind, though we were running before it at the rate of some ten knots an hour, was so great that it drove me with a steady push to the front of the poop where my commander was holding on. What do you think of it? He addressed me in an interrogative yell. What I really thought was that we both had had just about enough of it. The manner in which the great west wind chooses at times to administer his possessions does not commend itself to a person of peaceful and law-abiding disposition, inclined to draw distinctions between right and wrong in the face of natural forces, whose stranded naturally is that of might alone. But of course I said nothing, for a man caught, as it were, between his skipper and the great west wind, silence, is the safest sort of diplomacy. Moreover, I knew my skipper. He did not want to know what I thought. Shipmasters hanging on a breath before the throne, thrones of the winds, ruling the seas, have their psychology, whose workings are as important to the ship and those on board of her as the changing moods of the weather. The man, as a matter of fact, under no circumstances ever cared a brass farthing for what I or anybody else in the ship thought. He had had just about enough of it, I guessed, and what he was at really was a process of fishing for a suggestion. It was the pride of his life that he had never wasted a chance, no matter how boisterous, threatening, and dangerous, of a fair wind, like men racing blindfold for a gap in a hedge we were finishing a splendidly quick passage from the antipodes with a tremendous rush for the channel in as thick a weather as any eye can remember. But his psychology did not permit him to bring the ship to with a fair wind blowing, at least not on his own initiative, and yet he felt that very soon indeed something would have to be done. He wanted the suggestion to come from me so that later on, when the trouble was over, he could argue this point with his own uncompromising spirit, laying the blame upon my shoulders. I must render him the justice that this sort of pride was his only weakness, but he got no suggestion from me. I understood his psychology. Besides, I had my own stock of weaknesses at the time, it is a different one now, and amongst them was the conceit 
of being remarkably well up in the psychology of the westerly weather. I believed not to menace to mince matters that I had a genius for reading the mind of the great ruler of high latitudes. I fancied I could discern already the coming of a change in his royal mood, and all I said was, the weather's bound to clear up with the shift of wind. Anybody knows that much, he snapped at me, at the highest pitch of his voice. I mean, before dark, I cried. This was all the opening he ever got from me. The eagerness with which he seized upon it gave me the measure of the anxiety he had been laboring under. Very well, he shouted with an effect, affectation of impatience, as if giving way to long entreaties. All right, if we don't get a shift by then, we'll take the, that foresail off her and put her head under her wing for the night. I was struck by the picturesque character of the phrase as applied to a ship brought to in order to ride at a gale with wave after wave passing under her breast. I could see her resting in the tumult of the elements like a seabird sleeping in wild weather upon the raging waters with its head tucked under its wing. In imaginative precision, in true feeling, this is one of the most expressive sentences I have ever heard on human lips. But as to taking the foresail off that ship before we put her head under her wing, I had my grave doubts. They were justified that long, enduring piece of canvas was confiscated by the arbitrary decree of the West Wind, to whom belong the lives of men and the contrivances of their hands within the limits of his kingdom. With the sound of a faint explosion, it vanished into the thick weather bodily, leaving behind of its stout substance not so much as one solitary strip big enough to be picked into a handful of lint for, say, a wounded elephant, torn out of its bolt ropes. It faded like a whiff of smoke in the smoky drift of clouds, shattered and torn by the shift of wind, for the shift of wind had come. The unveiled low sun glared angrily from a chaotic sky upon a confused and tremendous sea dashing itself upon a coast. We recognized the headland and looked at each other in the silence of dumb wonder. Without knowing it in the least, we had run up alongside the Isle of Wight, and that tower, tinged a faint evening red in the salt wind haze, was the lighthouse of St. Catherine's Point. My skipper recovered first from his astonishment. His bulging eyes sank back gradually into their orbits. His psychology taking it all around was really very creditable for an average sailor. He had been spared the humiliation of laying his ship to with a fair wind, and at once that man, <clears throat> of an open and truthful nature, spoke up in perfect good faith, rubbing together his brown, hairy hands, the hands of a ma master craftsman upon the sea. Hmm, that's just about where I reckoned we had got to. The transparency and ingeniousness in a way of that delusion, the airy tone, the hint of already growing pride, were perfectly delicious. But in truth, this was one of the greatest surprises ever sprung by the clearing up mood of the West Wind upon one of the most accomplished of his courtiers. The winds of north and south are, as I have said, but small princes among the powers of the sea. They have no territory of their own. They are not reigning winds anywhere, yet it is from their houses that the reigning dynasties which have shared between them the waters of the earth are sprung. All the weather of the world is based upon the contest of the polar and equatorial strains of that tyrannous race. The west wind is the greatest king, 
the east rules between the tropics. They have shared each ocean between them. Each has his genius of supreme rule. The king of the west never intrudes upon the rec recognized dominion of his kingly brother. He is a barbarian of a northern type, violent without craftiness, and furious without malice. One may imagine him seated masterfully with a double-edged sword on his knees upon the painted and gilt clouds of the sunset, bowing his shock head of golden locks, a flaming beard over his breast, imposing colossal mighty limbed with a thundering voice, distended cheeks, and fierce blue eyes, urging the speed of his gales. The other, the East King, the King of Blood-Red Sunrises, I represent to myself as a spare Southerner with clear-cut features, black-browed and dark-eyed, gray-robed, upright in sunshine, resting a smooth-shaven cheek in the palm of his hand, impenetrable secret full of wiles, fine-drawn, keen-meditating aggressions. The west wind keeps faith with his brother, the king of the easterly weather. What we have divided, we have divided. He seems to say, in his gruff voice, this ruler without guile, who hurls as if, in sport, enormous masses of cloud across the sky, and flings the great waves of the Atlantic clear across from the shores of the New World upon the hoary headlands of old Europe, which harbors more kings and rulers upon its seamed and furrowed body than all the oceans of the world together. What we have divided, we have divided. And if no rest and peace in this world have fallen to my share, leave me alone. Let me play at quiets with cyclonic gales, flinging the disks of spinning cloud and whirling air from one end of my dismal kingdom to the other, over the great banks or along the edges of pack ice, this one with true aim, right into the bight of the Bay of Biscay, that other upon the fjords of Norway, across the North Sea, where the fishermen of many nations look watchfully into my angry eye. This is the time of kingly sport and the royal master of high latitudes sighs mightily, with the sinking sun upon his breast and the double-edged sword upon his knees, as if wearied by the innumerable centuries of a strenuous rule and saddened by the unchangeable aspect of the ocean under his feet, by the endless vista of future ages where the work of sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind shall go on and on till his realm of living waters becomes a frozen and motionless ocean. But the other crafty and unmoved, nursing his shaven chin between the thumb and forefinger of his slim and treacherous hand, thinks deep within his heart, full of guile, Aha! Our brother of the West has fallen into the mood of kingly melancholy. He is tired of playing with circular gales, and blowing great guns, and unrolling thick streamers of fog in wanton sport at the cost of his own poor, miserable subjects. Their fate is most pitiful. Let us make a foray upon the dominions of that noisy barbarian, a great raid from Finisterre to Hatteras, catching his fishermen unawares, baffling the fleets that thrust to his power and shooting sly arrows into the livers of men who court his good graces. He is indeed a worthless fellow, and forwith, while the west wind meditates upon the vanity of his irresistible might, the thing is done, and the easterly weather sets in upon the North Atlantic. The prevailing weather of the North Atlantic is typical of the way in which the west wind rules his realm, on which the sun never sets. North Atlantic is the heart of a great empire. It is the part of the west wind's dominions, most thickly populated with generations of fine ships and hardy men, 
heroic deeds and adventurous exploits have been performed here there within the very stronghold of his sway. The best sailors in the world have been born and bred under the shadow of his scepter, learning to manage their ships with skill and audacity before the steps of his stormy throne. Reckless adventurers, toiling fishermen, admirals, and wise brave as the world has ever known have waited upon the signs of his westerly sky. Fleets of victorious ships have hung upon his breath. He has tossed in his hand squadrons of war-scarred three-deckers and shredded out in mere sport the bunting of flags hallowed in the traditions of honor and glory. He is a good friend and a dangerous enemy, without mercy to unseaworthy ships and faint-hearted seamen. <clears throat> in his kingly way, he has taken but little account of lives sacrificed to his impulsive policy. He is a king with a double-edged sword, bared in his right hand, the east wind and interloper in the dominions of westerly weather, is an impassive-faced tyrant with a sharp poniard held behind his back for a treacherous stab. In his forays into the North Atlantic, the east wind behaves like a subtle and cruel adventurer without a notion of honor or fair play, veiling his clear-cut lean face in a thin layer of a hard, high cloud. I have seen him like a wizened, wizened robber, sheik of the sea, hold up large caravans of ships to the number of 300 or more at the very gates of the English Channel. And the worst of it was that there was no ransom that we could pay to satisfy his avidity. For whatever evil is wrought by the raiding east wind, it is done only to spite his kingly brother of the west. We gazed helplessly at the systematic, cold, gray-eyed obstinacy of the easterly weather, while short rations became the order of the day, and the pinch of hunger under the breastbone grew familiar to every sailor in that held-up fleet. Every day added to our numbers, in knots and groups and straggling parties, we flung to and fro before the closed gate, and meantime the outward-bound ships passed, running through our humiliated ranks under all the canvas they could show. It is my idea that the easterly wind helps the ships away from home, in the wicked hope that they shall all come to an ultimately end, and untimely end, and be heard of no more. For six weeks did the robber sheik hold the trade route of the earth, while our Ligo Lord, the west wind, slept profoundly like a tired titan, or else remained lost in a mood of idleness, sadness known only to frank natures. All was still to the westward. We looked in vain towards the stronghold. The king slumbered on so deeply that he let his foraging brother steal the very mantle of gold-lined purple clouds from his bowed shoulders. What had become of the dazzling hoard of royal jewels exhibited at every close day, gone, disappeared, extinguished, carried off without leaving a single gold band or the flash of a single sunbeam in the evening sky? Day after day, through a cold streak of heavens as bare and poor as the inside of a rifled safe, a rayless and despoiled sun would slink shamefacedly, without pomp or show to hide in haste under the waters, and still the king slept on or mourned the vanity of his might and his power, while the thin-lipped intruder put the impress of his cold and implacable spirit upon the sea and sky. With every daybreak, the rising sun had to wade through a crimson stream luminous and sinister, like the spilt blood of celestial bodies murdered during the night. In this particular instance, the mean interloper held the road for some six weeks on end, establishing his particular administrative methods over the best part of the North Atlantic. 
It looked as if the easterly weather had come to stay forever, or at least till we had all starved to death in the held-up fleet, starved within sight, as it were, of plenty, within touch almost of the bountiful heart of the empire. There we were, dotting with our white dry sails the hard blueness of the deep sea. There we were, a growing company of ships, each with her burden of grain, of timber, of wool, of hides, and even of oranges, for we had one or two belated fruit schooners in the company. There we were, in that memorable spring of a certain year, in the late seventies, dodging to and fro, baffled on every tack, and with our stores running down to sweepings of bread lockers and scrapings of sugar casks. It was like the east wind's nature to inflict starvation upon the bodies of unoffending sailors, while he corrupted their simple souls by an exasperation leading to outbursts of profanity as lurid as his blood-red sunrises. They were followed by gray days under the cover of high, motionless clouds that looked as if carved in a slab of ash-colored marble, and each man and <clears throat> each mean, starved sunset left us calling with imprecations upon the west wind, even in its most veiled, misty mood, to wake up and give us our liberty, if only to rush on and dash the heads of our ships against the very walls of our unapproachable home. In the atmosphere of the easterly weather, as pellucid as a piece of crystal, and refracting like a prism, we could see the appalling numbers of our helpless company, even to those who in more normal conditions would have remained invisible. Sails down under the horizon, it is the malicious pleasure of the east wind to augment the power of your eyesight in order perhaps that you should see better the perfect humiliation, the hopeless character of your captivity. Easterly weather is generally clear, and that is all that can be said for it, almost supernaturally clear when it likes, but whatever its mood, there is something uncanny in its nature. Its duplicity is such that it will deceive a scientific instrument, no barometer will give warning of an easterly gale, where it ever so wet. It would be an unjust and ungrateful thing to say that a barometer is a stupid contrivance. It is simply that the wiles of the east wind are too much for its fundamental honesty. After years and years of experience, the most trusty instrument of the sort that ever went to sea screwed onto a ship's cabin bulkhead will almost invariably be induced to rise by the diabolic ingenuity of the easterly weather, just at the moment when the easterly weather, discarding its methods of hard, dry, and passive cruelty, contemplates drowning what is left of your spirit in torrents of a peculiarly cold and hard rain. The sleet and hail squalls following the lightning at the end of a westerly gale, cold and benumbing and stinging and cruel enough, but the dry easterly weather, when it turns to wet, seems to rain poisoned showers upon your head. It is a sort of steady, persistent, overwhelming, endlessly driving downpour, which makes your heart sick and opens it to dismal forebodings and the stormy mood of the easterly weather looms black upon the sky with a peculiar and amazing blackness. The west wind hangs heavy gray curtains of mist and spray before your gaze. But the eastern interloper of the narrow seas, when he has mustered his courage and cruelty to the point of a gale, puts your eyes out, puts them out completely, makes you feel blind for life upon a lee shore. It is the wind also that brings snow. Out of his black and merciless heart he flings a white blinding sheet upon the ships of the sea. He has more manners of villainy and no more conscience than an Italian prince of the 17th century. 
His weapon is a dagger carried under a black cloak when he goes out on his unlawful enterprises. The mere hint of his approach fills with dread every craft that swims the sea, from fishing smacks to four-masted ships that recognize the sway of the west wind. Even in his most accommodating mood, he inspires a dread of treachery. I've heard upwards of ten score of wind lasses spraying like one into clanking life in the dead of night, filling the downs with a panic-struck sound of anchors being torn hurriedly out of the ground at the first breath of his approach. Fortunately, his heart often fails him. He does not always blow home upon our exposed coast. He has not the fearless temper of his westerly brother. The natures of those two winds that share the domin dominions of the great oceans are fundamentally different. It is strange that the winds which men are prone to style capricious remain true to their, to their character in all the various regions of the earth. To us here, for instance, the east wind comes across a great continent, sweeping over the greatest body of solid land upon this earth. For the Australian east coast, the east wind is the wind of the ocean, coming across the greatest body of water upon the globe, and yet here and there its characteristics remain the same with a strange consistency in everything that is vile and base. The members <coughs> of the West Winds dynasty are modified in a way by the regions they rule as a Hohenzollern, without ceasing to be himself, becomes a Romanian, Romanian by virtue of his throne, or a Saxe-Coburg learns to put the dress of Bulgarian phrases upon his particular thoughts, whatever they are. The autocrat sway of the west wind, whether forty north or forty south of the equator, is characterized by an open, generous, frank, barbarous recklessness, for he is a great autocrat, and to be a great autocrat you must be a great barbarian. I have been too much molded to his sway to nurse now any idea of rebellion in my heart. Moreover, what is a rebellion within the four walls of a room against the tempestuous rule of the west wind? I remain faithful to the memory of the mighty king with a double-edged sword in one hand and in the other holding out rewards of great daily runs and famously quick passages to those of his quarters who knew how to wait watchfully for every sign of his secret mood. As we deep water men always reckoned, he made one year in three fairly lively for anybody having business upon the Atlantic or down there along the forties of the Southern Ocean. You had to take the bitter with the sweet, and it cannot be denied he played carelessly with our lives and fortunes, but then he was always a great king, fit to rule over the great waters where, strictly speaking, a man would have no business whatever but for his audacity. The audacious should not complain, a mere traitor ought not to grumble at the tolls levied by a mighty king. His mightiness was sometimes very overwhelming, but even when you had to defy him openly, as on the banks of the Agulhas homeward, bound from the East Indies, or on the outward passage round the Horn, he struck at you fairly his stinging blows. full in the face too, and it was your business not to get too much staggered, and after all, if you showed anything of a continence, the good-natured barbarian would let you fight your way past the very steps of his throne. It was only now and then that the sword descended and a head fell, but if you fell you were sure of impressive obscuities and of a roomy generous grave. Such is the king to whom Viking chieftains bowed their heads 
and to whom the modern and palatial steamship defies with impunity seven times a week, and yet it is but defiance, not victory. The magnificent barbarian sits enthroned in a mantle <clears throat> of gold-lined clouds, looking from on high on great ships gliding like mechanical toys upon his sea, and on men who, armed with fire and iron, no longer need to watch anxiously for the slightest sign of his royal mood. He is disregarded, but he has kept all his strength, all his splendor, and a great part of his power. Time itself that shakes all the thrones is on the side of that king. The sword in his hand remains as sharp as ever upon both its edges, and he may well go on playing his royal game of quiots, quiots with hurricanes tossing them over from the continent of republics to the continent of kingdoms, in the assurance that both the new republics and the old kingdoms, the heat of fire and the strength of iron, with the untold generations of audacious men, shall crumble to dust at the steps of his throne, and pass away and be forgotten before his own rule comes to an end.